<laughs> okay, somebody uh, look up Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15. <clears throat> and somebody look up Hebrews 1.3. Okay. Who wants Colossians 1.15? Gail would like to read that. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Okay, so Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You know what's interesting about that? That image is a word that means something you can see, of course. Right? A visual. Uh -huh. He's a visual representation. Right, right. Okay. And it says that we were made in the image and likeness of God. Yeah. You know, Jesus is the image, the visible image of God. We're made after that pattern. Mm -hmm. We're made in that pattern after the visible image of God. Okay. It's not just likeness. It's image and like, it's vision, yeah. Yeah, and likeness. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway... <clears throat> Also, we had uh, Hebrews, well, that was Hebrews 1-3, right? Yeah. We had Colossians 1-15. Who had that? No, that was Colossians. Oh, then we want Hebrews 1-3. Yes, Bob. Who, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Okay. Oh, oh go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, mm -hmm. sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Right. So it says that he is the ex, uh, express image of his person, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what we have in that one? Yeah. Express image of his person. Yeah. So Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing. Is I'm going to read, uh, this is, my, my friend Pete wrote this, but I just like the way he put this, so I'm going to read it. Okay. And it says this. Um, you know, God says in Genesis 1-3, let there be light. And there was light, right? Mm -hmm. But which day did the visible lights appear? Okay, the question to that is, anybody Four. know the fourth day? So really, when there was, oh, which reminds me, Elise. Okay, so forgive me, just to pause for a moment. Is there anybody in here, right arm? Anybody in here who has a pain in your right arm? Right here. That's been bothering you? Here, right here. Miss Shirley has that? Right here? Yeah. Perfect. Elise uh, got a little word of knowledge about that, so Elise, go over and pray for Shirley. Right here. Absolutely. <laughs> now. <laughs> like N O W. <clears throat> Perfect. That's the one. That's the one, Elise. Go for it. <clears throat> oh, Father God, we thank you. We love you so much. You are so thank amazing. You, and right now, I speak to all the pain in this elbow, and I say, Pain, you go now in Jesus' yeah. name. Yes. Now, we want 100% healing, no yes. pain. Thank you, Lord. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Miss Shirley, can you look for that pain right now? Move it around and look for it. Are you looking for it? Are you finding it? No. Ah, very good. Very good. Excellent. 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 All right. So, so anyway, on the fourth day, the visible lights were created. So when he said, let there be light, they weren't talking about, he wasn't talking about the sun and the stars and all that stuff, okay? So for three days, that's 16 verses you go through, there is no visible evidence of natural light, okay? Now, God establishes a pattern in creation that we see in Genesis chapter 1. Number one, he speaks. What he speaks exists because he said so. God said, let there be light. You know, nothing's going to disagree with him. Boom, light. And in fact, if you look in the Hebrew, um, we word it in a way that makes sense in, in English, but in the Hebrew, it really reads like this. And God said, let light be, and light is. Mm -hmm. Like, the switch is on, it's forever now. Because he said, until he says stop, it's on. The switch is on. It is. Not it was. It is. It always is. It's always present. It's always going to be there until he says stop. Because when he gives a command, that's what happens until he says something different. So the physical light. So God uh, speaks. What he speaks exists. And then what he speaks manifests for all to see. Okay? So the light in Genesis 1-3 is a type of Christ in so much as God called light out of darkness on day three of creation and waited three days to bring about visible manifestation of that light. God likewise declared the light of Christ to the prophets of old, yet brought about no visible manifestation of that, of light, that light until the fullness of time was come. Okay? And that is true. Is that 
The light of the world's always been here, but he wasn't ex we weren't exposed to him until he appeared in the body of Jesus Christ. Okay? So the light was always there, but it was invisible. And the light was made visible, just like on the third day we finally saw visible light if you were hanging around then. I wasn't, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this also is the way it is as far as understanding Scripture. <clears throat> the um, prophets of the Old Testament were kind of like people painting in the dark. Because it says these things they were writing were not for themselves but for us at this day. Because the things they were writing, they didn't even understand what most of this stuff was about. Because they have not seen the interpretation of these words that are coming from God and the fulfillment of them in real time. It hadn't happened. Right. You're like, how is this all going to happen? And if it, if it was real plain, then when the time of Jesus to, to arrive, everybody would have known, well, I, they, they said it would come right at this time, but they were still scratching their heads. What, is this that? Are you the guy? Because they were in darkness in the Old Testament until the light himself came. And when Jesus, the light himself came, the whole Old Testament, all the dark sayings <clears throat> about the Christ and everything, suddenly the light was on them. You go, oh, makes sense now. Makes fully sense now. Why? Because Christ showed up. Christ showed up. Okay? So Jesus is an image of the Father. All right? He's the image of the Father. It says he's the image of God himself. The image of the invisible God is what it says. Okay? So I'm glad for this. I, it's just a personal thing. I think you'll be on board for this. Is uh, God is invisible in his purest nature, pure, purest form. Just he's invisible. Mm -hmm. He's everywhere all at once. Mm -hmm. And we could have died and gone to heaven mm -hmm. and been surrounded by this God that's everywhere all, all at once. Mm -hmm. And can't really see him because he's invisible. Right. And he's somewhere out there, but we feel him. Or we sense him. Sense him. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to give him a good hug, but you don't know how to do that since he's everywhere all at once. Right. I'm so glad that God decided I'm going to, for every eternity, reveal myself to my people in a body. That we can actually talk to Jesus face to face. We'll get to hug him, you know? We'll get to hang out with Jesus. Uh, you know, he didn't have to stay in that body, but he did. And I think he did for this reason. God doesn't have to do anything, but some things he wants. Like, he didn't have to create us, but he wants us. So why would he stay in that body? Because, you know what? If he puts himself in that body and maintains that body... It's so much easier for him to fellowship with us because he's of like so sort, of like sort, of like type. And so we'll be able to, to have that fellowship with him that's more intimate because he's not going to make us eternal beings that fill all space. That ain't going to happen. So he condescended to put himself in the body of a man. And it says, uh, the last um, chapter in the book of Revelations, it says, for the tabernacle, the tabernacle of God is among men. And it talks about, hey, he walks among them, he shall be their God, they shall be his people. Jesus is the tabernacle of God. Yeah. See, the tabernacle in the Old Testament was a visual representation of God uh, in, in figurative form. Okay, But Jesus is the tabernacle of God. <coughs> He's the real tabernacle of God. And the tabernacle just simply means tent. Okay, And the body of Jesus Christ is a tent that the Spirit of God in, in, embodied himself in to come down here to be born of a woman, to live a life that was sinless, to be tested by the devil, to die on the cross, to bleed, right, and to pay the penalty so that we could have eternal life. But he didn't just stop there. After he paid the penalty, paid the price, uh, satisfied the justice of God, then he raised himself from the dead and gave us the promise that says we have this eternal hope that's beyond the hope of the world because we know we're going to get a brand new body too. We're going to be raised again too. You know, and we're going to forever be in a glorified body as he is. <clears throat> so, Jesus is that aspect that we call the Son of God. But Jesus is no less God than talking about the Father, the Holy Spirit. No less, no less. People also like to put a priority that God never puts on it. Okay? You know, it's like, well, there's this hierarchy, you know, and the Father's at the top. I know it sounds right, but hold on a second. And, and then the, the son's next, and the Holy Spirit, we put him third because he's not even a person. He's just this dove. It's not true. He's the Spirit of God. Now, there are things where you have to understand, when you look at the theanthropist, the God-man, in the proper way, you'll see that there's an aspect of Jesus that is completely man, and an aspect of Jesus that is completely God. And those aspects are addressed differently at different times. Sometimes 
the addressing of what is being said is to the, the man, you know? Uh, the man is going to be forsaken on the cross, but the Spirit isn't, okay? The Spirit's always there and always present, okay? Um, <clears throat> so so in, 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 in spirit form, God's just one. It's the same, unique, and one. Uh, in form of how he was represented, there's a what appears to be a hierarchy. Why? Because uh, we can say this. We can say, well, God is not a man. The Bible says God is not a man. But he came in the form of a man, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So God's not merely a man. Let's put it that way. God's not merely a man, but this God that came in the form of man is not merely a man. He's the God-man. And he's all in one. He's all in one. Okay? Um, if you desire... To have a ministry like Jesus Christ, if you desire to do what he did, because he said we should be doing the same works he did, right? Then your ministry has to have the same goal. And the same goal is to save the lost. Okay? So, <clears throat> you know, on Chris was asking a question to Men's Fellowship on Monday. He said, What's our vision statement for Men's Fellowship? And you know what? We can write a lot of vision statements that are, have all kinds of facets to them that would be make good sense. But at the bottom line is it better be about saving the lost, okay? Going out, saving the lost. Because Jesus came out, came here to go out and save the lost. Mm -hmm. Everything he did was for the building of the kingdom, bringing people into the kingdom. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. <clears throat> now, you might go, yeah, but after, then he tells us that we should disciple and teach and all that. Well, you see, we're discipling and teaching so that right. more people can go out and get more souls. Yeah. We're not discipling and teaching so you just get better. So that you could be useful. That's right. So that you could do the work of the ministry, mm -hmm. which is the salvation of souls. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the Bible also tells us clearly, it says that if you have a brother that does certain things that are, well, the Bible would say was sin in the, in the New, New mm -hmm. Testament, um, it says you shouldn't even eat with such a one. But it says, however, I do not say this about the sinner. And what it's saying there is, is you should expect sinners to be sinners, and you don't have to isolate yourself from them because you're out there to get them saved. But if your brother calls himself a brother and is Christian and he's doing all this lame stuff that you shouldn't be doing, it's like, don't associate with that guy. Let him understand. You're not, uh, you're not doing the thing that keeps you in good fellowship, and uh, we're going to go out and help the sinners be saved. So, yes, go ahead. Is that in the, because um, I mean, I, I, the only scriptures that are coming to mind are about, you know, Paul warning about, um, you know, associating a whole lot with unbelievers and because it can cause you to stumble. Is that the same? Well, it doesn't. Yeah, okay. Because the way you just said it. Well, I have. Yeah, I have it in my office. I have. It, I I was working on part of the message, but I have it in, in Colossians. Um, but Chris, what were you going to say? Uh, when when Paul says bad company corrupts good character, I believe he's referring to believers who are in sin as opposed to unbelievers. It's true. Yes. It's true. You see, Jesus went out and hung out with the sinners. Okay. But he didn't hang out with the religious that were saying they didn't have sin, right? We have to be out with the sinners because that's how you get sinners saved. Yeah. You have to go where they are. Yeah. That doesn't mean you have to do what they do because you don't do what they do. Yeah. But you go where they are. But a brother who's walking disorderly, it says you should disassociate yourself. Yes, Holly? Is that a problem because most of America says they're Christians? So they say it. Well, so if you were going to apply that and they'd say, no, don't associate with them. All right, so here's, here's what you do. <clears throat> First of all, uh, does everybody that say they're a Christian, do they qualify as a Christian? Not everybody I'm is. Not saying, I'm right, not right, saying they are, right. but I'm just saying. So here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible says. Know those that labor among you. Yes. Okay? So I can't know everybody out there, but the ones I know, and if I know them and they're doing stuff that is like absolutely, you know, you're, you're doing the wrong thing and you're okay with it. I'm supposed to let them know that uh, I have to put a distance here. Tell you can get yourself straightened out. It might sound cold, but that's what Paul tells us to do. So I don't know what everybody else is doing, but if I know them personally and see them doing, you know, you know, if I go over to their house and they're, you know, shooting up drugs, I say, dude, <laughs> it's not right. You got to change. This isn't okay. And the Bible says, speak the truth in love. And so I'm going to speak to the uh, Christian who's slipping. I want to speak to them in love, but I'm going to speak to them the truth. Okay, so part of the love thing is that I don't let them slide back into darkness, but I help them to stop by saying, let's not push this under the rug, let's, let's face it. Here's the truth, you need to change this, you need to do something, rather than just watch them 
go down the path. No, it's not right? they don't want to listen to you. <clears throat> well, then you disassociate. Right, right. It says, it even says this, okay? Here's what it says. It says if someone does uh, wrong against a brother, right? It says if a brother does wrong against you, yeah. here's what you should do. You should go to that brother right. and basically try to talk it out. Yeah. And it says if he will not hear you, then take uh, another, another person with you. Right. If he will not hear the both of you, then take them before the church. Right. If he will not listen to the church, put them out of the church. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. Put them out. Kick them out. You're not part of our fellowship. That's what it says. And you might go, oh, that's, that's Old Testament. No, that's New Testament, actually. But it's an act of love. It's, yes, it is. It's, it's hopefully, it's, you don't do it like, we hate you, you're no good. You're saying, you know what? Um, you need to feel a little bit of the separation here because we want you to say, this is serious. I've got to do something. If I want to be back in fellowship, I want to do something. I want to change. I don't want to stay the same. It's not okay. Because it is not okay. You know, if you have a child and the child is going to start, start drinking alcohol or taking drugs and you see it starting to take over their life kind of thing, you're going to want to tell them to stop and they don't want to hear it. But why are you doing it? Because you hate them? No, it's because you love them. Because you know it leads to destruction. It leads to death. Right? It's called tough love. Well, you have to speak the truth in love. See, we can speak the lies in love or we can speak the truth in unkindness. But you've got to speak the truth in love. Okay? The motive has to be right. So... Whatever Jesus does, another thing we want to take up before we close out on this Sunday, whatever Jesus did, whatever Jesus does before anybody's eyes, is a perfect expression uh, in the flesh of the will of God being done. So a lot of the things that people wondered in the Old Testament, you know, how does God feel about this or that, all we have to do is look at the life of Jesus. How did G Jesus handle people? How did Jesus deal with sin? How did Jesus deal with uh, um, um, people uh, uh, accusing him and bitterly persecuting him. How did Jesus deal with all that? When you see that, you see the will of the Father. You see the heart of the Father. How did Jesus submit himself <laughs> to doing things he didn't want to do to the Father? Did he do that? Yes, he did. That's a perfect expression of the will of God. Because there's a lot of people who are trying to find the will of God in the scriptures, and it's like, you know, just what, if, what would Jesus, it really is true, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Okay? So, does Jesus go out and say, you know, like, they're praying in church, you're praying in church, and the person next to you is, you know, they just came into church, they haven't even repented fully yet. They're saying, oh God, have mercy. I mean, you go, boy, I'm glad I'm not like them, that low down, no good sinner. Jesus says, no, 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 wrong attitude, wrong attitude. You know, you were just like them, right? Treat them with love and bring them up. You try to build people up, okay? So Jesus wasn't about tearing people down. Jesus didn't go out there and tear people down. Now the scribes and Pharisees probably felt like he was tearing them down. Right? Mm -hmm. But what he was doing, he was just dismantling a faulty structure so that they could be rebuilt right. Yes. Okay? Because he loved them. Doesn't seem like he loved them, does it? You know, because he told them the truth and they didn't like the truth. You have to ask yourself, do you like the truth? <laughs> <clears throat> I, you know what? You know what? I, 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 have this one, I have this one attribute that's pretty good. One. Okay. Is... For the most part, I mean, almost, not, you know, there's got to be an exception to every rule. But I love the truth. For, and I'm saying this, even when it rubs me wrong. I love it because I know when I get it, it'll set me free in some area. If I say, you know, I don't, that's really hard for me to deal with, but I'm glad you told me because now I can be free in that area. You know? Did you have to have it? Um, no, <clears throat> it depends on how something gets delivered, like you were saying. Yeah. yeah in love. Yeah. Because you beat somebody over the head and stuff, yeah. they don't like that. <laughs> but you're talking about Jesus and the sins yeah. and that diet, the diatribe, whatever. Or you're saying, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Right, and right. You really suck it to them. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so remember I promised you there was going to be this true false part? Uh oh. Yes, yeah. Oh, it's easy, it's easy. I'm going to give you some statements, true or false. Okay. Number one, talking about the Son of God. He cured fevers supernaturally. True. 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 Now that's in Mark, I can tell you where it's Mark 1, 30. Yes. Number two, he healed skin diseases with a touch. Yes. Yes. Leprosy. Yes. That's true in Mark 1, 40. Number three, he cursed people. No, false. That's false. 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 And you will see the, the actually how he treated people that we normally would have cursed is Galatians 3, 13. Number four, he healed the sick without a touch. Yes. Then you go, oh, wait, that's not totally true because he did something. No, but did he ever heal the sick without a touch? Absolutely. Yes. Centurion's servant, yes. not a touch. Yes. 
Other people just said, rise up and walk. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's true. That's true. So, huh? Let's go back again. On the crossing, when he said, woe unto you, what is that? Right. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Uh -huh. What he's doing is he's doing this, okay? Here's what he's saying. He's saying that, that you are, he doesn't have to curse them because you're just saying this. If you reject God, okay, so example, if, some, if you said to somebody, preach Jesus to somebody, and they said, I don't want Jesus, I don't want anything due to him, and you're telling them, based on your, um, I don't have to curse you, I'm going to just tell you the truth. Based on your, the action you just took, you're on your way to hell. I don't have to say go to hell. I'm saying because you didn't make the right choice, you're going to hell. There's consequences. Jesus is saying there is going to be great sorrow for you hypocrites, you scribes and Pharisees. I'm not putting something on you. I'm telling you because you haven't accepted the truth, you're going to go through great suffering. It's just true. But he's not cursing them. He's not saying put a curse on you. He's not doing that because that's just a, a matter of consequences. If you don't do the right thing, stuff happens. Okay? Um, but you remember uh, Balaam, prophet Balaam in the Old Testament? <laughs> Uh, a king, a foreign king, paid Balaam, who was a prophet of God, sort of, uh, to curse Israel's people. So he basically, you know, you know, like just fall down and crumple up in battle and be defeated and whatever, whatever. And every time he tried to curse them, he could only bless them. Right? Okay? Um, God doesn't curse us. Jesus never cursed anybody. He never cursed anybody. He cursed a fig tree, but he didn't curse people. Okay? But he would tell them the truth, and the truth is this. Here's, see, the gospel is called the good news, but it's not good news if you don't handle it right. Okay? Because it's got with it two, two aspects. Here's the bad news. The bad news is you're all sinners. You're all going to hell. That's bad news. Yeah, but there's good news. There's an antidote to this. Yeah. There's a remedy for this. It's Jesus Christ. Okay, so the good news is, oh, my gosh, I have a way out. But you know what? You can still choose the bad news. You can choose to go that way, too. And woe to you. Yeah, woe unto you if you choose that, right? The woe is already there. The fallen state was, that, was where they were at. Jesus comes to say, I have an answer for you to get you out of that state. I have a way to, for you to escape, right? So if you listen to me, you can escape. But if you don't, whoa, it's going to be, it's going to be torment. Yeah. So anyway, uh, he did not curse people. He healed the sick with no touch. Okay, number five, Jesus raised the dead. Yeah, these are pretty easy, but I just want you to add them all up together. Let's see. He, he healed the sick. You know, he cleansed the lepers. He raised the dead. Do you know those are all the things he told us to do? In Acts 10 8. He said, go. He said, basically, preach the kingdom. You know, preach the kingdom. But he says, then I want you to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Okay. So anyway, um, number six, he refused to eat with sinners. No. False. Very good. He ate with sinners. Now, tell you what he wouldn't eat with probably those hypocrites. <laughs> the religious ones who said they have no sin. But he ate with sinners. Number seven, he opened blinded eyes. He did that. Now, do you realize everything we've said here is something Jesus did? But this is the thing. Is Take hold of this. Yes. All of those things you should be able to do. Amen. Because he said that. He said, the works I do, you're going to do them. And greater. Because I go to the Father. Yeah. Okay? And because I go to the Father, I'm going to send back the Comforter. And that's why it's going to be better for you. Because I go to the Father so the Comforter yeah. will come. When the Comforter comes, who is the Holy Ghost, he will come inside you. And you will have God himself living inside you. So nothing will be impossible for you. Woo! Yeah. Hallelujah! Amen. Right? So all this stuff, we go, well, that was in the, back in, way back in the Bible days. This should be the Bible days. Yeah. <clears throat> he opened blinded eyes. He cast out devils, Mark 1.25. Yeah? yeah? He did. Yeah, true? Yeah. Okay. Expressed compassion on mankind. He did. That's Matthew 9.36. He taught and preached the good news. He did. But you know, along with the good news is the fact that if you don't receive the good news, you've already got bad news. Yes. Right? He's like saying, you don't realize it, but you're all going to die of a plague, but I have an antidote. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want it. Well, then you're going to die of a plague, but I've given this to you so you don't have to. I've supplied this so that you don't have to. 
uh, he healed the oppressed of the devil. He did. He did. Which is an interesting thing right there because the way the scripture is, that is found in Acts 10, 38. Healed those, those oppressed by the devil. You see, there was a woman back there in Acts, a woman that was bent over for many, many years. And Jesus, um, well, that's, that's not found in Acts, but this, this is another one that, that I think works better. So the woman's bent over and Jesus heals this woman on the Sabbath day, right? Yeah. And she stands up perfectly straight. And the scribes and Pharisees are all upset. How, you work on the Sabbath day. That's terrible. You know, you're a blasphemer. You're not a God. And, and <clears throat> he says, look, this is a daughter of Abraham. And isn't it right and fitting that on the, the Lord's day that she be delivered from this oppression of the devil that she suffered for all these years? Mm -hmm. So in other words, there was a physical sickness that wasn't just uh, tied to a physical issue. It was tied to a spiritual issue. Yeah. There was a spirit of infirmity on this woman, and he delivered her from that. Was that also with the, with the man who was paralyzed for 38 years by the pool? With the mat? Well, he's by the pool of Bethesda, and he said, take up your pallet and walk, right? Um, I'm not going to, okay, so here's the thing. If you're going to talk about healing, you have two camps, okay? So I'm kind of, I stay neutral on it, which is in, the, in this area. Is some say all sickness is a manifestation of demonic spirits. And some say, some sickness is, is demonic spirits, some isn't, right? Mm -hmm. You know what, I don't know, but I, so here's how I treat it. Uh, I believe, I could put it this way accurately, all sickness is an enemy of God. Yes, amen. Whatever you want to call it, it's an enemy. Yes. Because it's a level of death, which is his big enemy. Yeah, that's right. Okay? It's not in the kingdom. It's not in the kingdom. It's not in his kingdom. So I can look at it, whether you want to look at it as a spiritual being or a bacteria or whatever, I know it's not what God wants. That's right. And so I'm against it, and I will stand against it. And I, you know, it can call itself whatever it wants, but I'm going to tell it to go. That's right. See, so that's why I deal with it. Now, sometimes, sometimes, though, it makes it, sometimes when I'm praying for people, it makes itself very apparent it's a demon. Yeah. Sometimes it's very apparent. It starts talking to you. Okay? And that's not all the time. That's just sometimes. And in those cases, I have no doubt it's a spirit. And I'll tell you what I have no doubt it's a spirit, and I've had this, gone through this many times, is I'll pray for somebody who's got a bad back or something, right? And uh, I pray for them. And, oh, well, it's gone, but now it's in my knee. And you pray for that. Oh, my God. Well, now it's gone. Now it's in my shoulder. That's a spirit, because there's nothing natural about that. Jumping around different parts of the body? That's right. It's yeah. a spirit. Okay. So he healed those that are oppressed by the devil. Number 13, laid down his life for his friends. Yes. Yes. Yeah? That's true. That's John 15, 13. He opened deaf ears. True. Yeah. yeah. You know, Elise, or not Elise, it was, uh, yes, Julie and I, yesterday, we were, we were trying to communicate to a man that was absolutely 100% deaf. He didn't even have hearing aids or anything. And we were trying to say, can we pray for you? <laughs> and it was a little bit, it was difficult. <laughs> but we believed that, you know what? Um, we just stepped out of the boat and here we are and find a guy that's totally 100% deaf. He's the very first guy we prayed for. the very first one. Yeah. And we go, we go like, oh, is that a good place to start? You know what? God thought excited. it was a good place to start. I still believe yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Healed. So we prayed for him. We prayed for him. I don't know if he, he couldn't hear us, but you know. And, <laughs> but we're not going to walk away from him. Okay. Jesus prayed fervently. Is that true? Fervently. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, now, if he is the example of God's will in action, shouldn't we be doing these things? Mm -hmm. We should be praying fervently. We should be healing the sick, delivering the oppressed, right? We should be preaching the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. All kinds of diseases, we shouldn't say, that one we don't pray for. We just pray for this one. We say, all of them, they're all, they're all infirmities that God doesn't have in his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to bring his kingdom to this earth. His kingdom come, thy will be done. I don't believe there's any sickness in heaven, right? No. So let it be on earth as it is in heaven, yeah. right? Um, number 16, held grudges against his enemies. No. no. Why, why do we then? Why do we? You know what? I'll confess. Oh, I got to go. We got to go. But I'll confess. Is I was thinking hard because I've all my life I want to make sure I walk in total forgiveness, you know? I don't want to un have unforgiveness for anybody. And I'm trying to think, is there anybody in my life? And I remembered a kid that was in, like, high school. And I hadn't thought of this kid in years. The kid's name was John. And I remember this guy, and it's like, oh, I hated that guy. He was a bully. And, and I thought, well, I forgive him, but, you know, I don't wish him too much well. <laughs> but I decided, I'm going to Google his name. 
Who knows? Maybe he's still out there somewhere. And boom, there's a picture of him, and I could tell by the face, that's the guy. And I said, you know what, John? I forgive you. Wow. Because that's what you got to do. You got to deal with it. If you find that, if you find it, deal with it. Because we can't be walking in unforgiveness. Mm -hmm. No, don't, don't have to. It's my heart that needs to get clean, not his. So, uh, he opposed false religion. Did he do that? Yes, he did. He said, pure religion and undefiled before God is this. He says, you're a doer. You know, you, you help the widows, the orphans, the fatherless. You do. You don't just talk. Because talk is cheap. Okay, so that's all the talking I can do. Yes, Elise? Okay, I'm stepping out one more time. I'm yeah. sorry, I've been I'm all right. really trying to learn. And I'm just wondering if anyone oh, in here has another one. a... Yeah, it has a sharp pain in the right side of their neck. Raise your hand if you do. Right there. All right, so anyway, stop stop here. Is I want to just say to you guys, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Now, next week, we are going to be talking about the next most important thing. We talked about who God is, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're going to be talking about who you are, okay? So come next week, and uh, thank you so much for coming. And Elise, go for it. All right, amen.